Good morning and uh, welcome to the 13th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2019. We have apologies this morning from our convener, Jenny Mara, MSP, and so as Deputy Convener, I shall convene the meeting in her absence. I'd like to ask everyone in the public gallery to switch off their electronic devices or switch them to silent mode, please, so that they do not affect the committee's work. Item one on the agenda is a decision on taking business in private. Do our members agree to take items three and four in private? Yep. Thank you. Agenda item two is consideration of a section 23 report, which is the Social Security Implementing the Devolved Powers uh, report. Can I welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning? We have Caroline Gardner, the Auditor General for Scotland, Mark Taylor, Audit Director, Gemma Diamond, Senior Manager, and Kirsty Ridd, Senior Auditor, all from Audit Scotland. I'd like to, at this stage, invite the Auditor General to make a brief opening statement. Thank you. Today's report is the latest examining how the Scottish Government is implementing the new powers arising from the 2012 and 2016 Scotland Acts. It focuses on the social security powers being devolved and assesses progress up to the end of February this year, takes account of the activity that's still underway and provides an update since I last reported in March 2018. The Government has done well to deliver the commitments it made for last year, including launching a new agency, Social Security Scotland, which will be responsible for the delivery of the benefits once they're devolved. The agency became operational in September 2018 and employs over 320 staff so far. The Government has also put in place the systems and processes needed to allow it to launch the first two benefits, the Carers Allowance Supplement in September 2018 and the Pregnancy and Baby Payment of the Best Start Grant in December. The Social Security Programme has laid the foundations to support the delivery of future benefits and pr promote its aims of fairness, dignity and respect. Publishing the first Social Security Charter and establishing the, establishing the Scottish Commission on Social Security are important parts of this. Against this background, however, delivering the first benefits has been harder than expected. The programme has been working flat out, and the scale and complexity of the work involved has become clearer as teams plan for the delivery of individual benefits. The programme has continued to find it hard to recruit the range of skills and experience it needs, and this has put pressure on staff and led to a greater than expected reliance on temporary and contractor staff. The programme's financial reporting has improved, but it still focuses on spending against annual budgets, and the programme doesn't clearly monitor or report how much it will cost to fully implement all of the benefits. Delivering the second wave of benefits will be a significant challenge. Wave 2 includes the most complex and highest risk benefits, with larger caseloads, much more complex eligibility assessments, and regular payments that will affect people's day-to-day -day incomes. There's a wide range of work underway to prepare for the next stage of delivery, including revising the overarching business case, reviewing governance and planning processes, and work to put the necessary resources, particularly staff, in place. The programme is doing the right things, but there's a risk that the pace of work and the constant delivery pressures may not allow the team time and space to make changes quickly enough. Critically, the Scottish Government does not yet have a clear understanding of the key things it needs to do to deliver all the remaining benefits in the way it intends. My report highlights the need for the Government to develop its critical path of the actions needed, and this should include a clear estimate of the overall cost to implement the social security system, reflecting the decisions and commitments that have already been made. As always, we're happy to answer the Committee's questions. I'm very grateful. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll move straight to questions then uh, with Colin Beatty. Thank you, Peter. Auditor General, uh, it's, uh, it's good to see a positive report. Um, what I am concerned is the recurring theme about uh, the lack of skills available in the market, and presumably that's particularly IT, although if there are other areas where there are skills lacking, it, it might be good to sort of draw that out and get a bit more information on that. Of course, um, you're right, they are skills which are in short supply <coughs> Excuse me, across government as well as across Scotland as a whole. Um, digital skills are a key part of that um, and so are programme management skills, particularly the agile skills that are needed with the approach that the programme is taking. Gemma, do you want to say a bit more about that? So this is a, a, a recurring problem that we've seen across many areas of government over the last couple of years, particularly on major programmes. Um, the programme is working really hard to try and get the staff it needs, and that involves 
um, includes working really closely with um, initiatives such as Digital Academy, where they're trying to grow their own skills to bring them into the programme and working with um, initiatives such as Code Clan to try and develop those skills. But it is a challenge for them. It features very heavily on the programme's risk register as, a, as one of their major challenges. Um, is also um, given the scale of the work and the number of people they co coming in and also the types of work that they're undertaking. So it's a large agile program. So some of those agile skills that um, aren't regularly found in government and um, that ab absolutely have an approach of growing their own, but also bringing in contractors to try and help them to learn throughout the program as well. Now, it's highlighted that uh, the uh, number of contractors uh, were, were about 107 and the number of full-time staff, 356 or thereabouts. So the number of, uh, of uh, contract staff is quite high. Of those contract staff, how many of them are IT? So we, in our um, exhibit on um, page 19, um, the Chief Digital Office um, in there has got 51 contractors against 46.4 permanent staff. So they, the, the Chief Digital Office has got the highest ratio of contractors and I suppose given the, the difficulties in the market, that's not a surprising position for the, for the um, Chief Digital Office to be in. They are um, absolutely trying very hard to address those challenges. One of the things they're doing at the moment is trying to find um, a strategic partner so that they can bring in contractors in a more managed and strategic way rather than having individual contractors from different places they have got a more strategic partner approach to that so that's something they are um, trying to do to address some of the challenges there. If you look at uh, primarily on the IT side that's a recurring problem throughout the public sector as our general stated there. How many we're in implementing a program here, so additional staff are needed to allow that to happen, additional techies are needed to allow that to happen. How many of the interim staff that they've got, the contract staff that they've got, would be replacing the equivalent of permanent staff, and how many are there really just to implement the program and would go away at the end of the program? I'm trying to get a grip of how, much, how big a shortage it actually is when the program is up and running and you know, we'll reach some sort of balance. So that's something that the programme are looking at at the moment in terms of what might the future needs of the agency um, be for running the system when it's fully operational. So they're looking at that at the moment um, and certainly what the digital office are doing are looking to see, well, actually then, how can they recruit into permanent post those um, positions that will move across into the agency. That work is ongoing at the moment and will be more developed over this year as part of the kind of full workforce planning approach at the moment. So there's no firm position on that, but through talking to them, we know that that is an approach that they are, th are looking towards. Paragraph 48 of the report highlights the lack of staff continuity. Uh, particularly, it's highlighted here that there's been three program managers and the post has been vacant for three months. What are the implications of that? And is it, again, a skill that is in short supply? I think Mark would like to come in on that one, convener. Yeah, uh, thank you, Auditor General. Uh, you asked at the start of your question uh, about the other skill areas and that experience of program management and uh, particularly experience of uh, managing programs of this size, size, scale and complexity is one of the, the things that have been really challenging for the program to get hold of. And the implications of that are it's a contributory factor very much to the things that we say around planning more generally uh, without having that key capacity and that key role of uh, being able to coordinate and plan and look ahead and no doubt an area will come back to uh, then uh, it makes that much more challenging to do obviously without the skills skills in place and also it means that as new people come in there's that additional uh, 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 on cost of getting people back up to speed and understanding and plugging into the, to the paragraph. The other area where there's been skill shortages, particularly is around finance, and that might be an area we come back to later too. And the question of the uh, programme manager? So in the program, so the programme manager is very much within that, uh, that overall sense of capacity for programme management, and that's a, a critical role. The, the programme management, uh, that, that's a key post, and, and, and uh, although it took a while to fill that, it's now been filled. But there's a whole range of people that go around that in terms of the project, the program and project management function. But they've already been through through three pro program managers, according to the report. Isn't that uh, exceptionally high? 
I think, that, I think that illustrates a wee bit the, the challenges here, and also the fact that this programme sits in the wider uh, set of challenges that the Scottish Government faces, and we say elsewhere in the report that in many areas there's a competition for, for, for our scarce resources in those areas. Within, within the, the resources available to the Scottish Government, there's obviously lots of projects come and go of varying sizes within the, 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 within the Government. Is there any transfer of skills from other areas to try and help here? In other, in other words, we've got people that have been through this, have the skills within the government. Can't we move them across to support? Gemma, do you want to pick that up? So, uh, for the social security program, this is, you know, the largest um, program of this scale and complexity within the Scottish government. Um, in terms of learning from experience, what the program has been able to do is to get people who have experience from across the UK into the program. So there are lots of people working on the program who have worked at DWP, for example, or on other big change programs across the UK. So they're being able to bring that experience into the Scottish government. Um, what the um, program director is looking to do is in that approach of kind of growing their own skills is very much that it's not just for the social security program, but there will be benefits then for the wider Scottish government, for the people who have worked on social security and had some experience can then go out and use that experience on other programmes. So it's kind of, I suppose, more work in the other way in terms of the pro social security programme, being able to give people that ex those skills and experience and then be able to go out and work on other programmes across Scottish Government. Presumably at the point that this project was uh, getting ballpark costings, they took into account the fact that there were skills shortages and they would have to go out and get contractors in. Has that side of it come in within budget? Is it what they anticipated? I think it's fair to say that the initial £308 million within the financial memorandum alongside the bill when it was introduced had to be a ballpark figure. At that point, there were many decisions that hadn't been made about the approach to delivering benefits, about the eligibility criteria, um, about the way in which um, it would be delivered and therefore the costs of developing IT and so, far, so, and so on. We say in the report that the number of temporary and contract staff and their cost was higher than was expected initially. Um, that's been managed within the annual budget so far for the programme as a whole. Um, but one of the key recommendations in the report is the government hasn't updated the overall cost of, the, uh, of implementing the programme since that initial £308 million that, was, that accompanied the bill. Um, and given there have been some significant decisions and more commitments for the future, um, I think it's important that that £308 million is now updated um, so that the programme can manage to it and so that Parliament can scrutinise it. Thank you. If I might just follow on, Colin raises a very interesting point about people being transferred in. Um, at paragraph 57, there's a line that says that staff are transferring between directorates, which I think You'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that means there's internal transferring going on between Scottish Government departments. Uh, and if I'm right on that, is what you're saying that in, in an apparently short-staffed uh, operation anyway, there are internal transfers going on where other government departments are cannibalising the people that we've got in the first place? Uh, you're right um, that there are pressures on the Scottish Government as, as a whole um, for the sorts of skills we're talking about here. Um, and as well as what I've reported on in relation to Social Security in last year's report on the Scottish Government, that sense of stretch and of um, people being moved to respond to the most immediate pressure um, is one of the things that I'm concerned the government is needing to manage with all of the other pressures that it faces. Um, I think uh, General Kirsty may be able to tell you a little more about what's going on in paragraph 57. Kirsty? Yeah, as the Auditor General has um, mentioned there, it's something that what we're um, referencing in that paragraph is that move between directorates where there are skill areas which are needed across the different programmes that are ongoing within Scottish Government, particularly around the project um, or programme management type skills. Um, it's something that's not unique to this programme. We see people moving between different programmes and it's not necessarily unique to Scottish Government either. It's something within civil service that we see um, as people being moved where skills are needed and people see indeed opportunities to from um, developing their own career and develop their own skill sets. Um, so that's definitely what we're um, relating to there. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, convener, and good morning. I wonder if I could pick up on the IT development uh, methodology that's been deployed here. 
I think from what you're saying is the, the initial phase of this has been pretty successful. It uses the Agile methodology, which is relatively new, uh, I think, as I understand it, for the Scottish Government to deploy. It's based in kind of shorter, faster turnaround, iterative developments, building only what needs to be done in the short term and, and progressing in that manner. So that's been pretty successful so far, but even we come to uh, wave two, Auditor General, you were saying in your opening remarks that things will become a bit more critical and a bit more complex there. Do you think that the, the continued application of that methodology and that practice will be sufficient to deliver the wave two implementation? Uh, I'm sure uh, Gemma or Kirsty will want to come in in a moment, but you're right, we think it has been pretty successful so far. Um, people often tell us they're using an agile methodology when actually they're not, they're really just not planning well enough for what, what it is they're trying to do. That's not true in this case, people understand it, they're putting the resources, the training, the management time into doing agile well, and we can see it in the way that they've responded to unexpected things uh, that have happened, like the... Um, failure to have in place the interface needed for the uh, pregnancy and baby grant, um, people were able to respond to that and put in place contingency plans that me meant they met the commitments that had been made. That's a good thing. But doing that has taken up a lot of time. People are working hard. There's very little time on top of what people are doing to manage the immediate demands to be planning ahead and um, particularly in the context where the Wave 2 benefits are going to be much more significant in terms of money, about 98% of the total spend involved still to, to be um, uh, delivered through the Wave 2 benefits. Much more complex in terms of the assessment of people's entitlement, um, assessing people um, as a one-off entitlement to a pregnancy and baby grants, very different to assessing their eligibility for something like the disability living allowance um, and regular payments rather than one-off payments. So all of that means it will be much more complex. Um, and my concern is that with the current um, short-term planning timescale and the pressure on resources, it will be very challenging to meet the commitments that have been made without getting that overarching timescale in place and the detailed financial and workforce plans needed to make sure the programme understands what resources will be needed and when to deliver them. You say also in paragraph 122 that they're thinking about partnering up uh, rather than continually bringing in contractors. Do you think we're thinking about partnering up with another company or agency? To that, that kind of delivers, I hope, more of a stability to the whole programme rather than continually swapping in and out contractors. Is that, my understand? Is that correct, my understanding of it? Yeah, absolutely. I suppose it, for the um, Chief Digital Office, it's a way of, I suppose, addressing that reality of the situation is that they are probably never going to be able to fully fill all the permanent posts that they would like to fill, given the shortages in the market. So trying to find a more strategic way of doing that rather than just bringing in individual contractors one at a time, that to have a more strategic partner relationship gives them slightly more control over that. Do you know where we are with that? Is it, is it done or is it...? That's still underway at the moment, as far as we're aware. It's, a definite, it's definitely going to happen. That's one of the options that they were considering at the time of the report. Right, right, okay. And uh, one of the things that I, I learned about Agile is that it's perhaps when you've got contractors coming and going so rapidly. In previous examples, that provided a difficulty for new staff joining the programme to understand what had been done. And it's all about writing software and producing proper documentation so that people can pick up easily. My understanding is that Agile doesn't lend itself particularly well to, to detailed, lengthy documentation as you go. Now, I may be wrong there, but that was my understanding in previous examples at this committee. So my concern may be that if, if, if you continually shift in and out contractors on a six-monthly basis and you don't have the substantive documentation within the system and you're facing increasing complexities that the Auditor General has outlined, that is bound to increase the risk for delivery there. Is anybody concerned about that? Or are they managing that process successfully enough at the moment? So what we have seen is that they've got um, very good governance arrangements over the programme. So in terms of technical architecture, they've got you know particular boards in place to consider um, those kind of issues to make sure that across the system everybody does understand what the, the technical criteria are. We know that as the programme moves into wave two and things become much more complex and the idea this, for this um, system, there will be one core system that deals with all benefits, unlike at the DWP where there's different systems for different benefits, this one system will cover all benefits. That creates a very challenging, challenging technical environment where you've got a system that is 
um, already delivering payments and making payments and one that you are also trying to expand to do new things as well. So they are currently considering is the current governance, the right governance to be able to manage in that more complex environment? How do you have governance in place where there may be two or more agile teams working in one particular area? For, for, to date, they've been able to have one agile team per benefit, which is much easier to manage. So what they are starting to think about is how do you manage agile at scale, essentially, and they're looking at what other programs have been able to do that, particularly across the UK, and how that works to see if actually their governance that they have at the moment and that has worked for them at the moment for the wave one benefits will be right when they move into that much more kind of complex technical environment into wave two. And that's, again, one of those reviews that is ongoing at the moment. When, Mike, when would you see the next appropriate point to give us some kind of update on the wave two implementation? Uh, how early or soon or might that be? This programme is one in a series of reports. Um, the team will be scoping up um, what we uh, will do next um, quite soon. But it's worth noting that now the Social Security Agency is up and running, we've also got the annual audit report coming through, and that might be an opportunity to provide an update to the committee on progress with the overall programme. Uh, so we'll keep you posted as that thinking develops. Right. Thanks very much for that, Convener. Thank you. Thanks, Willie. Um, uh, quick matter arising. I may have misunderstood this, but uh, Willie Coffey asked about partnerships with agencies uh, in order to, to get in talent, if I can put it that way, uh, which sounds like a good idea, but isn't that the problem that we've seen with some of the Scottish NHS, where you have... A, finite, a very small and finite number of agencies providing a small and finite number of specialists and therefore the costs go up and the churn also goes up. Is that a concern? There are some similarities in that whenever you've got a shortage of staff, um, there is a risk that costs increase, and we see that um, across digital skills as well as in the NHS. There's also a difference, I think, though, in that it tends to take much longer to train doctors as a cohort than anybody else um, from the time a school leaver enters medical school to the time at which they're a fully-fledged uh, consultant, for example, is much longer than the time needed to produce somebody with some of the skills we're talking about here. That's why the sorts of initiatives that Gemma talked about around um, uh, training um, staff, uh, making partnerships with uh, code base, civ tech, some of those initiatives that we mentioned in the report are so important. They can help in the short term rather than simply having to think about a 10 year time scale. And I think Mark's going to add something to that as well. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, uh, the other example I think uh, that, that a number of us around the table have had experience of is the agricultural payment system, farm payments, or where that was part of the solution there that was developed. And I think it illustrates that this isn't a silver bullet. There's a, a need for a range of things to be done to make sure the capacity is there. Underlying all of that is there's, there's limits in capacity in the market for these sort of skills and, and governments competing with uh, private sector and other parts of government for those skills. And that's, that's, that's the underlying issue that it needs to deal with. Thank you. And Thanks, Chair. Good morning. Uh, I wanted to change the focus a little bit to around decision making and then around costings. Uh, in the report, you say that continuous short-term pressures mean that it's difficult for the team to pause and refocus activity, presenting risks to overall delivery. Uh, many decisions about future benefits and how they will be delivered in the long term are still to be made. Um, or, you know, what, what decisions are outstanding and what, what are the implications of the delay and what decisions do you think should have been made by now that haven't been made by now? Um, I think it's um, important to start by saying the government's overall approach to this has been a commitment to safe and, secu safe and secure transfer of the new powers, delivery of the new benefits from the existing DWP responsibilities. Um, and that has um, underpinned the approach it's taken so far. So it chose to prioritise the Wave 1 benefits that were simpler to administer, um, easy assessment of eligibility, generally one-off payments, generally quite small numbers and quite small money involved, and it's been successful in doing that and learning from it. Um, it has now set out the time scale it plans to adopt for full transfer of um, responsibility for the remaining benefits, which is set out in Exhibit 1. Um, the, um, new, for new claimants, that will be complete by the end of 2021. The transfer of existing claimants will take until 2024. 
But within that, there are a lot of decisions to be taken about, first of all, um, how the benefits might be changed as they become Scottish benefits rather than UK-wide benefits, um, what that means in terms of eligibility, in terms of assessment, in terms of assurance that the right people are getting what they're entitled to and that other people aren't. And all of those decisions will need to feed through uh, to decisions about the work that the programme needs to undertake, the staff required in the agency, um, the IT systems that need to be in place. So there's some really important decisions that are still to be taken under that overarching um, timeline which is there. My concern isn't that those decisions should have been taken by now. I think that's a policy decision and safe and secure is what's driving it. But until those decisions are taken, it's very hard for the programme and the agency to be planning what needs to happen next, which is why I'd like to see that critical path covering the next three years. And, and how many of those decisions are, are time sensitive? So are, from what you're saying, is it if there are identical benefits to the current regime, then it's perhaps less time sensitive. But if there is to be a change in terms of either the value, the eligibility, as you say, that decision needs to be taken quite quickly so the infrastructure can be built underneath it? I think that's broadly true, and I'm sure Gemma will want to say a bit more in a moment. The other thing that's worth stressing, though, at this stage is that whatever decision the government takes, it will continue to have a lot of um, interdependence with reliance on DWP systems for the foreseeable future. Um, so making sure that the government's planning is can interact with what the DWP is planning to do, that systems are in place, information's available, all of those things in time should be affecting the decisions which government's taking as well as being affected by it. Gemma, do you want to elaborate? So we mention a lot in here that the programme's working in an agile way, which means it's kind of developing as it goes. And a key part of that is um, it bringing in the um, experience of users into that. So it's making sure that as it develops the benefits, the, it's consulting with users about what the, the um, most appropriate thing to do is. And there's a lot of kind of, I suppose, legislative steps within that in terms of setting out new regulations for, for new benefits as well. Um, what we're, I suppose, looking for um, at this point from the programme in terms of a critical path is showing where some of those interdependencies are. So which, in which order do some of these decisions need to be made and which will affect all parts of the programme, which will affect certain parts of the programme so that you can understand where some of those key decision points are and where the timing really matters on some of those, for example, if it affects a procurement and where there's some flexibility within other decision points and if you, for example, if one decision point was to be missed, what would the knock-on impact of that be? So what we're looking for is that level of critical path to understand where some of those time-sensitive decision points are and what impact that has across the programme. So just to clarify, what, what you're not seeing is what quite often happens in organisations is there is dithering on a decision and you sleepwalk towards a problem. That, that's not what you're suggesting. You're suggesting there's, there's policy decisions and implementation decisions that need to be made as we move towards the phasing of the benefits. Is that correct? It's absolutely correct. And I think um, the, the thing I'd like to stress is that's important, A, because it's so complex and those decisions won't be simple decisions, and B, because they're decisions that will affect some of the most vulnerable people in Scotland. So having that overarching timeline, as Gemma says, with the key decisions that need to be made and understanding what the effect of delays or bringing things forward might be feels to us to be critical now. Thank you. And, and, and then moving on to, to the costing, the, the report says the Scottish Government does not yet have a clear understanding of the key things needed to deliver all remaining benefits in the way it intends. This includes not monitoring and reporting how much it will cost to fully implement all benefits. Just to clarify, are, are you really saying that the Scottish Government isn't monitoring on the cost of delivering benefits at once devolved? Not quite. I wouldn't put it that starkly. Um, we have got the 308 million um, financial memorandum cost, and the government has now improved its annual financial planning and monitoring. So we um, show in the report in Exhibit 4 the amount that's been spent up until the end of 2018-19 financial year. Um, but the £308 million we know will have changed because of decisions that have already been made, um, contracts that have been let for IT, the staffing that's in place for the programme and the agency, decisions about benefits. And um, the government needs also to be thinking about the likely cost of the policy commitments it's made so far for the, the remaining delivery to update that £308 million, break it down over the time phasing that Gemma's been talking about, 
underpin it with um, particularly digital and workforce plans, and then start looking at the overall cost. That will enable the programme to make sure that um, the, the plans it's making are within the overall budget, um, to monitor spend as it goes, and obviously for Parliament to be able to scrutinise that in the way you should be able to. We'll come back to the £308 million in the financial memorandum in just a second, but just focusing on the monitoring and reporting of the cost, can you say what the implications of that could be for the taxpayer, for the cost effectiveness of the policy on the overall Scottish Government budget, or indeed the value of the benefit itself, if there isn't an adequate level of monitoring and reporting on the cost of implementing the benefit? You won't be surprised to hear me say that I think it's important for any significant um, project that's spending public money that there should be as clear an idea as possible of what that's going to cost and what people expect to achieve from it. Now, it's inevitable that the initial estimate is going to change, particularly with something that is as complex and fluid as Social Security is, um, but I think we're at the stage now where simply um, monitoring and reporting what's happening on an annual basis isn't adequate for the programme itself or for parliamentary scrutiny. Um, Mark, I think, can give you a bit more of a picture of what we would expect to see and why it matters. Yeah, thank you, Auditor General. I, th I, th I think the heart of this is that the, 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 the longer term costs of this need to be funded, and the government needs to understand how to manage that through time and in an overall sense. And there's a real need for transparency about what that total cost is. The other thing I'd add is that the focus of the monitoring activity within the programme has been on those annual budgets, and as we've set out in the report, there's been very little focus on, so what are the implications of this particular decision on that overall uh, 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 cost envelope and what that's likely to mean in overall terms, and we're clear that that needs to improve and that needs to shift on. We set out in the report some of the things that have changed, it's the, the £308 million estimate, and we've not seen evidence that those things have been factored into that a sense of what, know, what the overall estimate is. We're not saying that necessarily means it's gone up, not saying it's necessarily gone down, but it's changed, and things have changed since that estimate was prepared, and there's a real need for, more systematically, the programme to be able to factor those things in, and more systematically, the programme to report to Parliament around that. The last thing I'd say is that, of course, is linked to the planning point, that that is easier to do when you're clear what needs to happen in what order. So, from that, is it OK to say that there exists risks to the overall Scottish Government budget around the implementation and the monitoring and reporting of the costings? There are always risks to the budget with a project of this scale and complexity. We think it would be easier to manage those risks well if there were greater clarity about what it's likely to cost. And just to give you one specific example, we talk around paragraph 115 in the report about the budget for 2019-20, uh, where the programme estimated that it required a budget of 118 million. Uh, the budget that was allocated was 78 million. We think it will be challenging to manage within that. Um, and it's not clear whether the um, 40 million difference is being transferred to future years or is something that the programme expects to be able to manage out. That's the sort of clarity that's needed overall, particularly since we know there's much more volatility built into the government's budget because of the new tax raising powers. So, so there is risk to the, to the Scottish budget, either would be for a, a project of a size. Does that also mean there's a risk to uh, the financial exposure for the taxpayer? Absolutely. Um, I don't want to overstate the risk because, uh, as we say in the report, this has been managed well so far, but it is a very complex project um, and something which is brand new for Scotland as a whole. Um, it's clear that not only the costs of administering the programme, but also the costs of benefit need to be met from within the Scottish budget. And we're moving to a position where um, we are not solely relying on the block grant from Westminster. About 40% of the budget is now raised from uh, Scottish tax which can go down as well as up. Uh, so having that clarity about what it's likely to spend and how that's changing will fit within the government's um, overall approach to um, financial planning, um, its fiscal outlook, and we think this is a key component to get yeah. right. So, so, so there is obviously risk to the budget, risk to the tax, but is there also then risk to the financial value of the benefit? The government will have to make sure that whatever decisions it makes about benefits as it takes them on are affordable, as well as having the impact that it wants to have on people's lives. Um, and there's uncertainty in that. By their nature, social security benefits tend to be volatile. Um, in hard times, demand is higher. And we've seen in relation to the pregnancy and baby grant uptake was higher than expected, and therefore the costs were higher than forecast. That, that, that 
um, sort of volatility is baked into a social security system, and it's why I think it's so important that the uh, financial management and planning is longer term and more transparent than it has been so far. And final part on the risk around risk in the budget, risk on the taxpayer, risk on the benefit value. There's also risk in terms of the scale and the scope of the number of people that could could benefit from any benefit if there are those uh, failures to do adequate reporting and monitoring of the costs. Uh, I've mentioned the experience of the pregnancy and baby grant already. Um, the uptake was higher than was expected by the Scottish Fiscal Commission when it produced the forecast for that benefit. Um, in some ways, that's a good thing. It reflects more people coming forward to claim what they're entitled to. Um, but as we said, the cost does have to be managed within the overall Scottish budget, um, and the government needs to be as clear as it can be about um, who it expects to benefit, um, what it, the likely uptake is, and how any differences will be managed within the overall budget that's available. Yeah, and then, Auditor General, you, you said earlier on around <coughs> the £308 million figure, um, and that obviously now being an out-of-date out figure. Can you just say a little bit about how that ballpark, your own word, ball, ballpark figure was, was uh, come to and what that figure is more likely to need to, be, to look at if we're going to go by the current policy commitments made by the government? Um, the £308 million, as you know, is the figure that accompanied the legislation in the financial memorandum. Um, those figures are always broad estimates because a number of decisions have, have yet to be taken. Um, and um, that's the cost of the implementation, not the cost of benefits themselves. Um, so we now know some of the decisions that have been taken about the agency, its location, likely size, um, some of the things that Gemma's been talking about, about procurement of um, IT systems, uh, continuing relationship with DWP, arrangements for bringing in the staff that are needed. All of those things will have affected the number. Um, we're not in a position to update it for you, but I think it's very important that government is able to do that and to account for any differences which are involved. Do you think that would be quite a significant difference? or? I think it's very hard for us to say at this time. Um, I'm not sure if Mark or Gemma want to add to that, um, but it's really a question for, for government. Mark? Yeah, just, just to just give a sense of the sort of things that have yeah. been going, up, going on and a sense of scale around that. So, uh, paragraph 65 sets out some of the things that have changed since the government, with, uh, the government came up with the original estimate. We've talked elsewhere about how the staffing needs to grow and has grown, and that staffing uh, in the programme is larger now than was anticipated in, initially. Uh, we've uh, talked about some of the decisions that have been made to date around digital infrastructure, which were, were, were just simply assumptions uh, when the initial cost was made. Uh, we talk about in the report about uh, some higher than expected costs of administration with DWP. Uh, and also, there's some areas where the scope of the programme has increased with new benefits identified and scoping ar around other areas included in the scope of the programme. So there's a range of things there. What we can't see is well, what numbers are associated with those and how do those interplay with one another in terms of that overall sense. The key point that we're making is that 308 uh, needs to be updated and there needs to be clarity about what's behind it. We're not saying that that will be a final answer. That's something that needs to continue to be reviewed and updated as we go along. But I think there's a real need for a greater focus on that in the programme and greater transparency around it. Thank you. Thank you. Alex Neil. Thank you, Convener. Can I just first of all declare an interest because I overall cabinet responsibility for social security uh, <coughs> between 2014 and 2016. Um, can I begin just by probing a wee bit more on the skills people shortage because it's quite a significant, I mean 30% of staff short uh, is a very significant level of vacancy. Uh, can I first of all ask a, a related matter to vacancy rates is, is there a high turnover rate of staff in the Social Security Agency? It's important, um, before I bring the team in, to say that the 30% vacancy rate we refer to um, is in the programme staff rather than in the agency. Right. Um, as we understand it, the agency is finding it easier to recruit the staff it needs and its vacancy levels are lower. Um, that's partly a, a matter of the sorts of skills involved. Right. Um, I'll ask Gemma to pick up the question about skills more generally. Yes, yeah, so we've kind of mentioned um, already around about the, the um, issue of trying to, trying to bring in the skills that are needed when they are needed um, within the programme, and that's certainly something that came through very strongly um, to us um, when we were undertaking interviews for this, for example. It was a constant theme that was talked about in interviews in terms of the... Um, the time and effort it takes to try and f find those skills, the number of recruitment rounds that some people have to go through. So it's 
one unsuccessful round, two unsuccessful rounds, and, and the time that that takes and the toll it takes on people in terms of trying to trying to keep that going. So it was a very much um, the kind of, I suppose, our findings for this were not just about the vacancy rate, but actually from talking to people and kind of understanding um, the challenges of, that that brings, and also some of the examples of the impact of that. So, for example, on the, the, the program management office, for example, and that um, turnover of staff in there, what that m meant in terms of them not under being able to undertake all of the planning work that they might have wanted to do, and also for finance staff and, um, for example, inputting into business cases. That was an area where, due to lack of resources, they were not able to input into business cases as much as they had planned to. So we could really see across the programme, not just in terms of the actual numbers of vacancy rate, but actually how it felt to people who were working on that programme. So just looking at this, uh, according to the report, there are 320 people currently employed by the Social Security Agency. Um, the complement should be 556, according to your report. So there's a shortage, obviously, of uh, about 136 or so uh, of people. So of that 136, how many of those are short in terms of the operation of the social security system in Scotland that we're un we've got under our control? And what proportion say for the IT, now you referred to the programme staff, is that the IT programme staff or is that who, you know, who, who are the programme staff? Are they part of the Social Security Agency or is that a separate entity? Sorry, I probably should clarify that the language a wee bit around about that. So the programme are the um, people within the directorate who are managing the implementation of the programme if you like. Yes, absolutely. That's where the big shortage is. And, it, and with the Chief Digital Office, which sits alongside that, which is the largely kind of IT staff. Right. right. Um, within the agency itself, um, the people in the agency <coughs> are largely um, responsible for the operational delivery of the benefits once they have passed. So essentially the programme manages the kind of up to the implementation and when it goes live, it passes over to the agency and the agency is then responsible for the ongoing delivery yeah. of that. Um, and in terms of the agency numbers, they have, um, as the Auditor General said, they have found it much easier to recruit operational staff. Yeah. They have had some difficulties around about some finance, experienced finance staff, but largely they have been um, have not found the same challenges um, as the programme. Right, okay. And the programme staff shortages, are they very much focused in IT skills? So not just IT skills, um, we talked earlier about the kind of importance of programme management skills um, right. and that being an area of difficulty, particularly in agile um, skills as well and posts such as kind of business analysts as well, that's been an area What's of... What's an of agile sugar. skill? So somebody who has, has worked on an agile programme, so somebody who has worked in an agile environment and understands the agile methodology as opposed to the, the kind of the waterfall methodology that used to be used on programmes. Right, okay. So uh, uh, the pro pro presumably most of the programme uh, shortages relate to job vacancies in Edinburgh as opposed to Dundee. Across Edinburgh and Glasgow. Edinburgh and Glasgow, right, okay. And that's part, particularly with IT, there's a general shortage. I think we're short every year of about 7,500 IT graduates compared to what we need in Scotland in the private and public sector. Okay, so... Um, Th that's a big challenge, obviously. Can I just ask, you know, obviously the programme uh, staff have a responsibility for uh, planning the capacity um, to be able to hand over to the Social Security Agency capacity in terms of procedures, policies, um, uh, you know, uh, all the different way things that are required in order to deliver the programme. Is there likely to be, I mean, the, the, the target date for completion of the transfer of the existing benefits that are being transferred is 2024. Um, is that likely to be met, that deadline? Is it likely to be brought forward or could it be brought forward? You know, what's your kind of sense at the moment of where we are in terms of the achievability of 2024? 
We say in the report um, that um, it will be a significant challenge. We can't, we're absolutely not saying it won't be done. I think personally it's unlikely it can be brought forward. Um, but given the experience so far and the effort and commitment that it's required from staff to achieve successful delivery of the Wave 1 benefits, given the ramping up of Wave 2 in the ways we've discussed around the number of people involved, the complexity of assessments, the need to start making regular payments, all of that will be a challenge. Yeah. So, um, and that's for the benefits already being transferred? That's for the Wave 2 benefits, which are things like uh, disability living allowance, personal yeah. independence payments that are of quite a different nature uh, to the one-off grants we're seeing in relation to carers allowance supplement, baby and pregnancy grants, yeah. and the um, carers allowance supplement. So can I ask, when I, when I was jointly chairing the committee with David Mundell uh, to arrange the transfer and plan the transfer, one of the things we agreed was that if you looked at the DWP IT systems, there were two problems. Number one, a lot of them were pretty antiquated, and they themselves were struggling with their systems. And secondly, it wasn't one system. I mean, there was a multitude of systems. They didn't even, at the beginning, know how many systems they had, and, and we would have to transfer. So it wasn't in a fit state for us to just sort of take over the Scottish bit of the IT systems because, quite frankly, in their own admission, it wasn't fit for purpose anyway. And they, they themselves, I think, are planning major changes in their IT structure. So as a result of that, we agreed to make a distinction between the date of transfer of policy decisions and the date of transfer of the where we would take control of our own computer or design our own computer systems. So, for example, in relation to universal credit housing benefit, we wanted very quickly, we ideally wanted to introduce a weekly payment option instead of a monthly payment option. And the computer systems they had couldn't do that, so we settled for a fortnightly payment option. I'm not absolutely sure where that currently stands, but the issue was the policy. We, the policy change. Yeah. The, so my question is, the policy change could take place even although it was still being administered by the DWP. Is that still the case? And you know, are there more policy changes that could be made and brought forward from 2024, even although the implementation and the operation of the policy might need to reside with DWP in a contractual basis? There's lots in that question, and between us we'll do our best to answer it. We say in the report at paragraph 125 that the Scottish Government will take over executive competence for all the developed devolved benefits no later than 1st of April 2020, next year. Um, now, that's, that's the, the power which lets them make those sorts of choices that you're talking about. Um, and it has um, made some changes to the administration of universal credit, the Scottish choices element of that, as part of wave one. Um, now, the ability to make more of those changes will depend on uh, both the capacity within the programme and the agency um, to, to make that sort of change alongside all of the other work that needs to happen, and, as you say, on the ability of the DWP system to actually deliver uh, things that the Scottish Government may, may want to do. Um, and there's a lot of complexity in that, which um, I think people are still uh, coming to fully understand as they delve into um, something like the Baby and Pregnancy Grant, Pregnancy and Baby Grant that's been delivered. Um, it, it, particular information becomes clear in that case about um, the, the software module that was required to do what was wanted. People had to do manual workarounds to be able to deliver it on time. That was done successfully. But it's a good example of the sorts of complexity that gets uncovered once people start to do the detailed work. Gemma, I'm sure you'll want to add to that. Yes, um, I suppose we mentioned in the report as well about the good relationships that the programme has with DWP and how long those relationships will be required for in terms of that really close working um, with the DWP. Um, the DWP in terms of IT and technical it is a very, very complicated system, as you say, with lots of different systems um, holding lots of different information. So there is no real simple answer in terms of being able to get some of that Scottish information um, um, from those systems and again that kind of I suppose incremental way of working in terms of bringing um, benefits on board when the programme is ready for them allows them to investigate each one of those at a time to make sure that they have a, a, an approach that 
can be managed and they can manage the risks around that and there are any kind of manual interventions that are, are required um, in that process. But it is clear that there's going to be a need to be very close working between the programme and DWP for quite a long time ahead. The final question is, by 2024 then, Scotland will have its own, if you like, independent social security system covering these benefits with its own IT systems and so on and so forth. Yep. So, supposing additional benefits are then devolved to Scotland, is the design of the IT and other structures, operational structures, designed in such a way that it could much more easily accommodate the transfer of additional benefits that are not currently legislated for being devolved? So what they're trying to do with the design of the system is to make it as flexible as possible so that it can essentially accommodate whatever changes to benefits that they would like to, to make, for example. So as the programme um, and government... That's a different question. I mean, yeah, changes to the benefits we've got control of, obviously that's going to be built into the design. But my question was a different question about capacity. If we get significant additional devolution of other benefits not currently being devolved, the systems that are being built in Scotland, the independent systems, if I can call them that, would they have the capacity to administer additional benefits if additional benefits are devolved? So I suppose at the moment, what we only see at the moment is the system as it's built to deliver wave one benefits and it will be built on to deliver wave two benefits so at the moment we don't know what the full capacity of that system would be as it's only been built at the moment to deliver wave one the government might be in a better position to kind of talk about exactly what the scale of the system might be in the future as it's built on for each benefit right but at the moment they've got no plans to build on the additional benefit if we get additional devolved benefits I think what that's not in the plan, is it? I think what we can say is that the approach that's being taken is one which is flexible and iterative, so it can be built on, because we haven't got that critical path of um, where, the go where the government expects to be and all the key steps between now and 2024. Right. It's not possible for us to say that that degree of sort of capacity flexibility um, will be available, yeah. and that may be a question that the committee wants to put to, to government. government yeah. um, and I think Mark's got just a little bit more information yeah. to add right. for you. Just one example that might help. So, so we say in the report that at the moment DWP undertakes the payment system uh, uh, and, 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 and the reliance on that is because of the sheer number of volume of payments and the payments that are anticipated and the initial solution uh, that government's decided is to continue to use that system. It may make another decision down the line. It may look to bring, and it, it, it intends to bring its own payment system in to be able to cope with that level. But at this stage of the programme, the current solution is to continue to use DWP, DWP, DWP systems for that. And those are the sort of choices that, we, as we've illustrated throughout, still need to be taken uh, and still need to be planned for. Right. Very brief supplementary from Willie Coffey, please. Hi, thanks, Convener. Just on that point that Alec raised there, it's a bit like um, you're setting out to build a house and you build the house and then later on you want a garage, which is new. So, I mean, as long as you've got the skills and the capacity to build the thing, all you need is a little bit of budget and a little bit of time to deliver it. Is that what we're talking about is not little bits of skill or time or money, but the principle applies. And we do think the foundations are designed to be flexible and to be built on. But as Mark says, some of those key decisions haven't been made yet. Yeah. Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, I've heard what my colleagues have asked about, and I'll try and keep out of the detail. I tend to look at your summary, which usually tells you what you need to know. And um, we've spoken about key message four a little bit, which, if I can paraphrase for the moment, sort of says the government knows where it wants to go, not sure how it's going to get there, how long it will take, or how much it will cost. Now, in the same day that um, your report was issued, the Cabinet Secretary um, issued a letter. I presume you've seen that as part of the, the papers. And you know, three pages, maybe up to three quarters, were picked up on the perceived plaudits in, in your report. Um, I didn't get a feeling from it that um, she realised the seriousness of item four of your key messages. Do you believe the cabinet secretary really understands how serious this matter is? 
Um, I think it's very hard for me to um, interpret what the Cabinet Secretary's uh, view of the report is in that way. Um, I think the team's um, very firm conclusion from working with people in the programme and the agency is that they absolutely understand the scale of the challenge. They're very self-aware. Um, they are good at um, both lessons learned once the benefit's been delivered and also um, having plans and contingency in place for when unexpected things emerge. What we're saying, though, is that the next wave will be a real step up in terms of complexity uh, and pace of what's required, and that's why it's important for the government not only to have its own confidence about what it's doing, but to make those plans available for parliamentary scrutiny. I've maybe asked you this before, but do you discuss your report with the Cabinet Secretary? All of our reports are cleared for factual accuracy with the government. That normally happens through the accountable officer um, rather than um, with the Cabinet Secretary direct, and I haven't discussed it with the Cabinet Secretary, although for full disclosure, she and I were in the same BBC studio on the morning that this was published. Okay. But, uh, I mean, having read the, the letter, um, maybe you or your team, do, they, do you take from that that um, there are serious measures afoot to, to solve this? I think it's hard for us to comment on the letter in isolation from everything else we know. Um, the letters to the committee and the committee may want to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary about it. Um, I think we can only give you the assurance um, from the work we've done um, over and above what's in the report that there is a good degree of self-awareness and that the challenge will be significant. Gemma, do you want to add anything to that? I think what we can see as well is that the... Um, and as we say in the report, that the programme is doing a lot of the right things to try and address these challenges. So it, as we kind of have mentioned in the report, there's a lot of reviews underway, a re review of finance, review of governance. It's building the plans at the moment for that critical path and for finance. So it is starting that work. I think one of the risks that we draw out in the report is that the pace of delivery at the moment then g it makes it very difficult for the programme to be able to actually stand back and implement all of those changes in time for... Um, in time for wave two. So we certainly took assurance from some of the work that was already starting to try and address some of those challenges. Didn't take too much comfort from the letter. I mean, it's all about in progress. If I can just change to a slightly different topic. Um, I think in Paragraph 77, you talk about um, fraud issues. And again, it talks about a fraud team being established and I think procedures being established. Now, you've been paying out benefits and claiming benefits for some time now. Should this not have all been in place from before day one? Um, the benefit started being paid in September last year, um, and obviously that, that's continuing to be rolled out. Um, we make the point in the report that this is a really important area. Um, first of all, it's important that people do receive the money they're entitled to, and at the same time, it's important that public money is protected, and there's a, a risk of fraud inherent in this. Um, I think we are uh, satisfied with the um, work that's underway, but again, it's part of this pace of uh, work that needs to take place to make sure that all of that remains fit for purpose. So does that mean there's a period when there were no fraud procedures in, in place? Mark, you look as though you might want to add to that. The short answer to that is that we're looking at the detail of that throughout our, our, through our current annual audit process and looking at, uh, as the uh, agency pulls the accounts together, what the detailed arrangements around that are. Uh, I think you're right in your suggestion that... that, that, that those sort of controls are not things that you can add in downstream. Uh, there are a number of things that we're aware that the agency has been doing and we're uh, looking at the detail of that. And in time, we would expect to be able to uh, uh, share some of that detail with the committee. So that would come out of your annual audit? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, a few questions from me, if I may. Mark Taylor, you referred earlier on to concerns about the capacity of the finance team. And in fact, in the report of paragraph 68, you make that point. In the minister's letter that Bill Bowman was just referring to, uh, she talks about there's a new finance team in place. So are you just able to elaborate for us, uh, what impact has that, the, looking back, what impact has the, have the finance concerns had? And do you think that the new finance team is, is going to be able to take this forward in a safe and secure manner? So, so in terms of looking back, I think one of the 
uh, contributory factors to some of the concerns we express around f monitoring of overall costs has been that capacity of the finance team. Uh, and also, uh, we also highlight that uh, in terms of looking at some of the bigger decisions, some of the individual project teams, that there's not really been enough scrutiny uh, around the longer term financial implications of some of those decisions. And again, I think uh, that the finance capacity has been really stretched around that. And we touched earlier on the skills challenges around that. I think that the, the, uh, at the same time, there has been improvements. There have been improvements on annual uh, budget monitoring, and there's been improvements as terms of the annual budget figures. So there's that kind of balance of some things have got to move forward, but really capacity has played its part. I think it's not all a capacity question. There's something about uh, where attention is paid, and I think we've been clear that there needs to be more attention paid to the financial side. So it's both having the skills and capacity to do the work required to support governance, but also the attention that governance arrangements play to that. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned governance there, uh, rightly. Uh, your report, by and large, is pretty positive uh, about the government's governance and organisational arrangements, but it does say, uh, and I'm referring to paragraphs 43 and 44 here, uh, that every so often, because of the pace that things have gone at, every so often there has been a decision taken to, to just go outside the standard processes. You've talked throughout this session at length about the challenges that are coming up. And of course, one of the things this committee sees all too often is where decisions are taken outside the normal processes to try and meet demand, to try and make sure everything goes to plan. And then we end up in a situation where we've witnesses in front of this committee uh, trying to pick up the pieces. So given that the pace of delivery, the pace of change uh, is going to continue at the same or even greater speed, how confident are you that the Scottish Government is on top of this issue and that these deviations will not continue and, and happen in the future? We also say in the report um, in part three um, that there is a review underway of the governance arrangement, some of those decision-making processes and uh, the finance function being strengthened. Um, I welcome that. I think it is a recognition that the problems um, that we've identified as having an effect so far um, are risky given the increase in pace and scale that you've referred to. And I think it's too early for us to assess whether they're having the effect they need to have. Um, it's certainly something we'll be monitoring again through the audit of the agency and bringing back to this committee in due course. Mark, do you want to add any detail to that? I think in terms of detail, I think one of our, one of our concerns is if you look on page uh, 34, paragraphs uh, 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 117 through 122, uh, no apologies, uh, 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 the, the, just find the right bit of the report, page uh, 30 uh, on uh, uh, paragraphs 96 onwards is the range of activities that the, the, the government's underway around governance and how it's organised thing. So we recognise they're doing the right things, but there's so much of it being done. There's so much of it being done around financial capacity that we talked about. There's so much of it being done around how do we speed up decision making. There's so much of it that's been done around the IT side, and there's a big list there of all those things that have been done. So we're not saying they're not doing the right things. It's going to be really hard to do that alongside uh, continuing to deliver wave one, continuing to deliver wave two, and, and, and the whole list of things that are there. And that's the root of our concern, is that there's so much to manage and, and, and do in, in terms of those reviews. Well, that's precisely the point. And if, I might ask a, a wrap-up question, unless anyone else has anything to come in on, which is, we've said quite a lot throughout this session that, that wave two is going to be hard, I think was the uh, word used at the start. There's work underway, they're revising the business case, um, there's a need for resources. I, I think Gemma Diamond, you talked about, it was much more complex. Uh, and right back at the start, uh, Auditor General, you said the Scottish Government doesn't necessarily know what needs to happen, let alone be in a position to, to make it happen. So it rather begs the question, going back to Alex Neil's point about 2024, if this doesn't happen, if these processes can't be put in place, if the uh, IT resources aren't in place, if the staffing isn't in place, what happens then? Does it, do the benefits devolve and get put in place anyway, or is there another pause? If I may convene, I'll attempt to wrap up answer rather than just picking up that. You're right. We say in the report the government has done well to get this far. It's laid some important foundations and that it will be a significant challenge to deliver the Wave 2 benefits as planned, given the scale and complexity involved. 
we know that it's aware of the challenges and there are a number of things um, underway to respond to them. Um, we also know that, um, as Marcus said, there's a lot of things that need to happen at the same time and the government doesn't yet have that detailed understanding of what actions need to happen when to be able to deli deliver the timeline that's set out in the report. We know the government has prioritised safe and secure transfer of the new responsibilities. Um, I think that's a reasonable approach to take, given the amount of money involved and the impact on people's lives. It would be for government to be thinking about what its contingency plans are if it can't uh, deliver the timescale that's required. And we think that the planning will maximise its chances, as well as making sure that Parliament can scrutinise this very important process um, in an appropriate way over the next few years. I'm very grateful. Do members have any other further questions? Just one very final one, and that is, um, in terms of payments, and so our local government pays out quite a lot, obviously, it ministers uh, council tax and uh, housing benefit, uh, as well as benefits of their own in terms of uniform grants and so on. Is there scope to use the local councils more as um, delivery face-to-face -face type agencies and, and to also, from a policy point of view, get close in the long term, get closer coordination between the kind of support that local government provides, integrated more with the kind of support that we're going to provide through the social security system. Um, as I think um, you'll know, Mr. Neil, the government is committed to. Um linking closely with local governments face-to-face uh, -face support um, staff and um, services to help claimants access the benefits they need. I think they've ruled out the um, possibility for now of using council's payment systems, uh, partly because of the challenges of complexity that we've talked about. But obviously, once the um, devolution of this set of benefits is complete, the Scotland Act 2016 did include a power for um, introducing new benefits in Scotland where they can be afforded and it would be um, entirely a matter for any government to think about how they were uh, delivered and who they were uh, targeted at. Good. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Auditor General and your team uh, for your evidence this morning. And I now close the public part of this meeting as the committee moves into private session.